This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 206 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show. Hope springs eternal. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. The show is sponsored by Kentucky Performance Products, scientifically proven supplements for your horse, and also the Barn Works, marketing and more for the equestrian professional. You can find them all at StableScoop.com. Welcome to the Stable Scoop, with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. We bring you the news through hail or high water, while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop calls. It's time again for Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. Stable Scoop. I am Glenda Geek. And I am Helena B. And you're listening to my favorite radio show on the Horse Radio Network, the Stable Scoop Radio Show. <laughs> you're just biased. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I, I do, we did ask uh, people what their favorite, on Facebook, we asked them what their favorite episodes were. So if you get a chance to hop on over to our Facebook page at stablescoop.com, at Stable Scoop, just search for Stable Scoop, and post what your favorite episodes might have been in the past. And we've gotten a lot of different comments on that. Um, the Horse Husbands episodes seem to be very popular. It was hysterical. I, know. I, guess, I guess people want us to make them laugh. I guess. And then uh, what was the one in here I wanted to see? Oh, The blooper the, one. Yeah, bloopers were in there. Uh, there are too many good ones to really say, but I recount the horse... Uh, the horse and the bear was really something. Remember, we had the girl on about the bear. Yes, yep. Uh, Her horse and, chased off the yep. chased off the bear. What was the one? Somebody had said they they liked the CB. Oh, Cleveland Bay, yes. right? Yes, right. CB Cleveland Bay. And then also, uh, this person said, "Just went back and had a look. Wow, that's a lot of shows you've done." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. Try being us. <laughs> What are they going to talk about this week? <laughs> oh, I don't know. What did we talk about last week? <laughs> Let's you know, just not talk about that again. It's funny we do. You know, we haven't repeat. I keep saying to you, we need to revisit some of the topics we talked about in year one because mm-hmm. we, we and, and we just, we never get around to it. We still coming up with new stuff. So um, we did. We probably do need to do that. Like I, you know, I would love to talk to the cloning people again because we talked to them way in the beginning. Yeah, and, and now they can be in the Olympics. And the cloning, you, if you remember, I, it was a really hot topic back then, and so much has changed in favor of cloning now. So it would be interesting to talk to those same people and find out, you know, what's new. They probably have all kinds of new things in cloning that they didn't have then. I am so not interested in cloning. <laughs> Nothing's changed for me. I still think it's creepy. <laughs> Yeah, but um, that's okay. The, the I was going to make an extra one of you for the weeks you couldn't make it. You couldn't handle it. The world couldn't handle an extra one of me. Are you kidding me? Your poor husband. I couldn't handle an extra one of me. <laughs> it's funny. And, and like your daughter really wants two moms. One's bad enough. <laughs> well, she wasn't complaining. She's not complaining when we're at the horse show together, nor when I was playing in the waves with her at the beach this weekend. Yeah, I'm her beach buddy and her barn buddy. She's all over her mommy. Yeah. Is the water cool enough or warm enough at the beach right now? Oh, my God. It's It's perfect. It's July absolutely. is the only time of year, Helena, the beach is a mile away. She has July and August. That's it to go into water. No, we can go. June, you can go. So I've, we've been swimming in June. You, there's actually, you could, sometimes you can go in October. In Definitely heated, go in September. In heated yeah. uh, body suits. No, it's, no. it's uh, October. I would say like the, probably the latest I've ever been in the ocean up here has been, I think, Columbus Day. But you can definitely go in September, occasionally in June. But once the ocean has a chance to warm up, you know, the, the later in the season is easier versus and they June. I say but... it's a little warmer up north than it has been in the past. Uh, so you, you actually have a, a pretty good year for that this year. Yeah, it's, um, and it's been hot, hot, crazy hot, humid with no air movement up here. The deer fly population is out of control. 
it's out of control. I can't even, I ride at seven o'clock in the morning and I, we can't get anything done because we're both shaking our heads, getting, trying to get rid of the deer flies. It's crazy. I know down here we, we've been having nice weather actually. <laughs> I hate to say it, but everybody else in the country has been much hotter than we are here in Florida. And it's like today it's 79 degrees and you're having uh, almost a hundred, um, but those mosquitoes have been bad down here. We've had an infestation of mosquitoes. It's just they said it's the worst year they've seen in a long time. I kind of, you know, I keep saying it. The Aztecs are probably right. December 22nd's it. The end's coming. They're well, just... that's fine. Anything to get away from the deer flies <laughs> the deer at this flies. point. <laughs> So what, what about today's show? What's coming up? We are t- we have a really cool guest today. We have Janine Jakes, and she's got all kinds of cool letters after her name. Um, <laughs> but probably the most important is that she's founder and chair of an organization called HopeForHorses.org. That's Hope Number Four Horses.org. She is um, – Dr. Jakes is a professor at Mount Ida's School of Biz- Business up here in the Boston area. But she's also a lifelong horse lover, fox hunter, and a devoted mother. So she's got her hands full. But in January of 2010, she started Hope for Horses, which is a new nonprofit organization aimed specifically at preventing younger horses from going to uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, she – well, the organization spends a lot of their time – purchasing horses directly from kill buyers at auction houses like the one down in New Holland in Pennsylvania. So if you are at all familiar with the horse slaughter issue, you know that horses are often sold by the pound for their meat. So Hope for Horses goes in and they buy the horses out from the kill buyers and they transport them to their holding facility in New England. From there, they... um, they get some groceries, they get rehydrated, they get a gentle pat, they get whatever medical care they need, and then the process of returning them to useful, happy lives starts. So it's they have sort of this slightly different but so far successful model for rescuing horses, and uh, Janine Jakes is going to talk to us a little bit more about exactly how that works. Plus, your husband has been dealing with something that we're, we're, we're going to play a little bit at the stay to the end of this show. And if you didn't get to hear it, you definitely want to. On this morning's Horses in the Morning show, we did a segment on Lyme disease in horses. Well, your husband now is dealing with, a, uh, with Lyme disease in people. He, he sure is, and, and uh, it's not something that you want to deal with. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what, what are all the ramifications of Lyme disease in horses, and we're going to play that uh, for you a little bit later in the show, just because we feel it's so important. And of course, I've been battling Lyme disease for a very long time, so it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I uh, would like to get the word out about it, too. So that's all coming up in today's show. But why don't we start with uh, Dr. Is it Jake's? Dr. Janine Jakes, yes. Okay. We'll start with her and talk about the good work that she's doing. So welcome, Janine, to the Stable Scoop Radio Show. I'm really glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me. So Hope for Horses, this is, um, it's, it's a new deal, and it's a big deal for you and for a lot of horses down in Pennsylvania. Um, give us a little background on you. What's your horse experience, and how did that lead you to founding Hope for Horses? Um, well, I grew up in a an equestrian family. I've had horses all my life, but I'm not the traditional equestrian. I own horses. I've always owned horses, but um, I've gotten away from. I don't do anything with ribbons. Primarily, I fox hunt. Um, I, it's uh, the way that my life has unfolded. I ride very rarely, um, just because of time. But during the fall, I'm you know I'm a regular on um, on the hunt field, but. During the rest of the year, I'm also a professor, um, and I've um, involved in a, in a couple businesses, so my schedule is pretty tight. But I do keep um, my hands in the horse community, and I make sure I go over to the quarantine barns and our stables on a regular basis and shovel stalls and lift hay bales as part of my regular exercise routine. So. <laughs> I bet you're fit. <laughs> yeah. There's so nothing actually, like I, carrying water buckets and hay bales to for your right. uh, building up some muscle. So, okay, so yeah. you're not your your typical uh you don't go chasing points. You you pretty much go chasing mares and no. geldings is what you do. Yeah, no, I'm not a traditional horse chick. Okay. And no, I, characteristics so, but not all of it. So, I'm guessing then you've been around them enough to see what you you understand anybody who has an affli- uh, I say affliction and I, I should 
I mean affection, <laughs> but really it's an affliction <laughs> for horses, um, knows that we've got the issue of horse slaughter in the United States. How did you connect horse slaughter with, holy crow, I have to do something about this. It's, it's time for me to do something. Um, you know, it was back a couple of years ago, um, and when I joined Facebook, I started to notice, um, I must have gotten in with the wrong crowd, uh, I started to notice, um, like, you know, postings of horses that were um, in need of homes and things like that. And I've always, one of my um, experiences with horses, I've always worked with problem horses and young horses. Actually, my top event horses, my mother bought off the uh, the meat truck, so... Um, and were my, my dad's ex-race horses, so I'm really good with young horses, and I saw a horse out there, a nice little filly, and I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe I could give her a home. So I direct bailed her um, from New Holland, and um, she came back, and she was really sweet and easy to work with, and I was able to find her a home, and it was a really good experience. And then I started doing a little bit of research, and I learned that 130,000 horses go to slaughter each year, and, you know, like many other equestrians, I thought, well, Slaughter doesn't happen in the United States, so it's not an issue. But in reality, it's much worse because the horses are shipped to Canada and Mexico. And um, when you start to learn about first uh, the, the slaughter process that happens across the borders is unregulated and inhumane. And then on top of it, these horses are shipped in very small um, areas, meaning like you know there'll be there'll be twenty to thirty horses stuffed into a Mack truck and then shipped. Mexico in the hot sun um, with no food, no water, no rest. And I started to realize more and more about that and learn more and more about it. And it's kind of tied into the economy, so the numbers even, um, I think 130,000 is a, um, a generous estimate. I think this year we're going to see more um, closer to 160,000. Um, and I thought, well, I could save one, but maybe I could do a couple more. And we began, I, uh, you know, I went through my list of um, close friends pretty quickly and found um, that a lot of people would love to save horses, but they don't have the time, they don't have the commitment. And I was able to find a business partner, um, Missy White, to step in and um, help on the other end of Hope for Horses. So she and I do this partnership together. Um, and when we first brought these horses in, you know, we rescued, we went down to New Holland and we rescued five of them. We, and, we should mention um, we should mention that New Holland is a sales stables in oh. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, sort of southeastern Pennsylvania that uh, that has a big auction. Been there for forever, ever since I can remember. I actually went to high school in New Holland, about two blocks away from the auction, and I had an office when I was doing my investment business that was I could see the auction was behind my office, and uh, right beside it is also a stinky cheese plant where they make uh, cheese, <laughs> and it ju- between the cow smell of the auction and everything, and then the cheese plant, it's a very odiferous area. Odiferous. Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> um, and if you've never been down to Amish country, it's kind of shocking. <laughs> um, but one of the things down in New Holland, you know, there's they'll run about 200 horses, I believe. I'm just guessing from the numbers I've seen down there. That's probably um, light. Every actually. Monday. That's probably light. And there's yeah. there's regular buyers in there that are buying horses for pleasure horses and Amish people looking for Amish driving horses and um, individuals looking for whatever. Um, I got one of my best horses. ponies ever there um, for a hundred bucks. Save yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great resource yeah. if you're. It, yeah, it's not yeah. just for the meat buyers. It's yeah. it's for uh, anybody who can get down there and look for a bargain. You have to know what you're looking for. Yeah. But but in addition there's, to these people, there's, there's something bargain. else. Well, but in the audience, and pretty much in every um, every live auction, there's always a couple kill buyers. But New Holland is the most popular for kill buyers, and they'll pretty much pick up the you know run the numbers um, on the, the profit zone of uh, slaughter. And anything under three hundred dollars is in danger of being slot, uh, being bought by a kill buyer and sent to Canada. So if you if you do go down to the auction, don't be buying horses for seven hundred, eight hundred dollars because those are the ones that are not at risk. But the horses that get down to the three hundred dollar range, especially, then start to look at the size of the horse um, and the and the um, the age of the horse. Of course, the younger horses are a little, bit, hate to say it, but more tender. Um, so. Um, Anyways, we went down and bought five horses and bought the back here, and um, you know they're all turned out together, and they all got sick, and you know because um, they're exposed to so many um, you know illnesses that are traveling through the the auction circuits, and so we're wrapping legs and you know and giving antibiotics, and we rescued another group, and it was just so much work. 
on top of our regular schedules and keeping jobs that we um, I, we sat down and we thought, well, is there a better way to do this? And um, if you look at the percentage of horses that are considered unwanted, 1% of the horse population, that's about 170,000 horses in America, is unwanted. And there's 9.2 million horses in America. So I started thinking, you know, if we could just get the community more involved, if we could just find more people that were like Missy and I that were willing to take in a horse and do some training and um, and work on the rehoming. And so Hope for Horses kind of split the whole rescue process into four compartments, and they call it the four R's. The first is, you know, rescuing it from um, the kill buyer. The second is uh, rehabilitating, whether it's just putting weight on them, going through the 21 to 28 days of quarantine, bringing them back to good health. And then we look for individuals to do the remaining two R's, which is the retraining and rehoming. Because a lot of these horses, especially, you know, Hopeful Horses focuses on horses that are under the age of three. And the reason that they're in the kill pen is because they've had no training at all. And, um, you know, I, you know, I'll rescue a two-year-old um, quarter horse that's unbroke and maybe not even halter broke, and I'll find a, a natural horsemanship trainer who's willing to take it in. So Hope for Horses will pay all the expenses. We'll pay to bail the horse. We'll pay to ship it up here, quarantine it, get it back to health. And then we'll give it to the natural horseman under a no-slaughter contract, of course. And um, they'll put their time, you know, their their donation is up is in um, in their time, and they'll do all the training, and then they'll sell the horse. And I don't really care if they sell that horse for $5,000 and have a profit because the horse, in the end, has a better chance at life, the more training that goes into it, it and a higher value. So... So that's, that's a very that's interesting. Stuff. I think that's that's a very interesting uh, divergence from some of the other rescue groups. Is that you focus on a niche, so you you pull them out of this bad situation and get them started on a new journey uh, to a new life. So, and and you're basically giving this prospect to to these trainers. You're, you're like, here, we we got them healthy. We pulled them out where they're ready for you to start. You're giving them essentially a blank canvas. Right. To right. do with what they want. But at the same time, you're not taking on the burden, the extra burden of maintaining a full scale rehoming or retraining operation. You're just pulling them out and getting them back on their feet. Sending them off. I don't pull out a horse unless I have a commitment from an individual or approved individual or a trainer that's willing to take it. Otherwise, you just end up with a herd of horses. <laughs> well, so, no, yes, unfortunately. That, that goes back that. to the, the uh, affliction that I talked well, about before. It's hard. And especially if you have an empty stall, you're like, oh, I have an empty stall. I'll fill it. And then it becomes, well, I have an empty corner of the pasture. Or, or I could make that right. a paddock. Or, oh, there's a couple of trees I can take down. And it, Especially when you're involved with the, the kinds of horrors that you probably see yeah. every Monday. And so well, how... Okay. Go ahead. It makes, you, it makes you walk around to people's barns. All of my friends are walking around I'm like, you know, you got an extra stall. I could help you with that problem. <laughs> so you look at the problem differently. But a lot of rescues get themselves in trouble because, um, you know, the horses, you look at the, the poor horses in the, in the kill pen or that you know they're owned by the, the kill buyer, and you're like, oh, my God, I want to save them all. But you ha- really have to recognize that, first of all, not all horses are – are able to have a second life, as sad as it may be, and you really have to focus on the ones, on pulling the ones out that you think are sound enough mentally and physically to have a second chance. I mean, there's been horses that we people have pulled out that we brought them home and they turn out to be, you know, 25 years old and all we could do was euthanize them. But at least at the end of the day, they died peacefully versus on a truck with 30 other horses. So it's all it's all good, but and that's a um, big you, deal. That's a very very important deal uh, point because because the slaughter process it, it's the process. It's not so much the ending of a life for human consumption. We do we deal with that all the time. Um, yeah. You know, we just don't see it happening at the grocery store. And and in some cases, the methods of slaughter are actually can be quite humane. But the journey from for that twenty five year old horse, that journey from New Holland to his or her destination is is likely to be the most torturous. And so oh, awful. even yeah. if it's just a a ride on a trailer from Pennsylvania to Boston with the windows open and a cool breeze only to arrive someplace with a gentle pat and, yeah. uh, and a humane euthanasia, 
it's sad, but it is special and it's important. Yep. And it's only one, but uh, that horse probably gave a lifetime of service to more than one right. person. And it's that's, almost, that's, that's our gift. Sad. That's what we can give back to that animal. Well, that one particular horse is a polo horse, and you, you've been to polo. You know how hard those horses work. Oh, God, yeah. And I had, I had a, a person who rides polo who offered to sponsor that horse's, um, you know, the, to purchase it and ship it and euthanize it. So it was a really nice ending story for that horse. Mm. Um, but not all of them are, and, end that well, that's for sure. i got to tell so, you, too, if you guys, um, yeah, the just happen to know a lot about this particular topic, having lived there. Um <laughs> It used to be, I hate to say this, but it used to be 100 times worse than it is now there at that particular auction. There was one guy, I'll give him credit here. His name is Rod Hartman, and I knew him from years ago. He was the chief of police in New Holland, and then he became the judge, a judge in the area. And he went on a vendetta against New Holland auction. And he would have the state police and veterinarians come in. He started having them come in every Monday, and any animal that wasn't fit to be there... Uh, they would fine him huge amounts every Monday. He would fine him huge amounts. And what got so expensive for the auction house that they finally had to start limiting. And you won't see, years ago, you used to see half-dead horses, horses with huge holes. You won't see that anymore coming into oh, the right. auction. And that's all because of this one guy by the name of Rod Hartman, who, who was a judge in the area. Then he started contacting the state, his state police buddies, and what he would have them do, he, then he went on a vendetta against the trucks. And what he would have them do is have them sit outside of town and pull over every truck coming out of New Holland that had horses on it. And he had them start fining them for too many horses. Uh, Double-deckers were a problem, and they, they've sort of fixed some of that. But uh, yeah. he would start finding the truck drivers. And he it was this one guy's mission that really cleaned up New Holland to make it 100 times better than it ever was. Um, it, 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 I've been there so many times, and it's actually not that bad. There'll be a group of horses that are kind of thin— um, but you don't really see too oh, much. I'm telling um, you, though, Janine, there were times we'd there. go over there, there were horses with gashes the size of Oklahoma in them. And, mm -hmm. you know, four-legged lame where they would have to pretty much drag them into the auction ring and sick to the nth degree. Just disgusting stuff that you don't see that so much anymore because every week now the police are there and the veterinarians are there. Oh, the police uh, and vets? I mean, I know oh, vets yeah. sometimes go down, but I didn't know the, oh, the, the police You'll see state stand police in there now. I don't know if you have, but a lot of times they'll be undercover or, or, they'll, be, or they'll be in uniform. You'll see them in uniform. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. that's part of the problem is enforcement. You can, have, you can have a ban on this or a ban on that, but who has – what government agency or even what state agency has – the financial resources to enforce these laws. So, but you know, even just one uniformed officer can make all the difference in the world. Uh, and in this case, it was one guy yeah. with a vendetta, and I'm not quite sure why. But <laughs> we, who cares? <laughs> Let's bring it on. That's great. Uh, yeah. Maybe we need more horse lovers on the police force. <laughs> there judges. you go. We need more all right, judges. scoopers. <laughs> if you're looking for a career change, consider joining your local police you, force. I, I then you can go and, and enforce all kinds of humane horsey laws for us. You have the expensive part of this oper operation. You have to buy the horses, you have to rehab the horses, then you have to pay to have the horses trained. How are you affording it all? Oh, I don't pay to have them trained. Those go okay. to the, go, go their, their, um, their sponsors. But yeah, no, so we do the, uh, we buy them from the kill buyers um, or New Holland directly um, or even some of the or, uh, non-profits that are, exist that are buying from um New Holland, um, and we we fundraise. We do a lot of fundraisers. Missy and I have discovered that we're really good at throwing big, fabulous parties and making <laughs> money that way. Um, one of our big fundraising initiatives that we're just rolling out now that I'm really excited about is um, the Equine Rescue Network. And what this is going to do is it's going to, um, because my background, my PhD is in computer science, um, and my background is e-commerce, so I figured, like, how can I fundraise on, on um Online. So what the Equine Rescue Network is going to do is, for all of those people, the trainers that want to get involved and do their retraining and rehoming, they can go in and sign up through the Equine Rescue Network and become kind of what I call the on-call list, so that when we're down at New Holland, I can actually go through a, um, an electronic list of people that might want to take a young horse that I see that's about to go into the auction ring, because I want that commitment before we buy anything. Um, and secondly... One of the things that, um, if you do any research on 
um, the economic factors of horse ownership, everything is going, all the expenses related to horses are really, and people's salaries are going down, and the expenses, of course, are going up like the rest of the world. Um, so the Equine Rescue Network makes owning horses more affordable by offering coupons for all horses and also coupons specifically for rescue horses. So let's say you are one of the people that do take a, um, a horse in for retraining and rehoming. I have veterinarians, blacksmiths, massage, uh, equine massage, dentistry that will offer you 25% off, 50% off. My blacksmith, um, or blacksmith can advertise up there for you know the free first-time trim. So you can, you can print out all these coupons and all of the services that your new rescue horse needs are going to be reduced. But I also want to drive traffic, um, and therefore there's a side for just all um, horses in general that you can get, you know, 50% off at, um, you know, on Tuesdays at a specific tax store. Um, you know, there's discounts on hay and shavings and things like that. So, um, and each one of the business businesses that advertise out there is going to um, be giving a small donation to Hope for Horses, and I'm hoping to kind of create a a much bigger fund so we can do more because when it comes down to the business model that we have at Hope for Horses, it really equates to the more money I can raise, the more horses that we can save. So this is my next big initiative on top of everything else that we do. I'm really glad. I know Helena will feel the same way. I'm really glad that you do the business model you're doing with uh, only rescuing horses that have, you know, have a home in mind, because there have been so many of these rescues in recent years, and, and they're by good-hearted people who want to do good but have no willpower whatsoever, like you talked about, <laughs> and <Yep. laughs> they end up with their horses being rescued. I mean, it, 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 they can't afford to feed them, and they end up. Uh, you can end up over your head very quickly, and. We see that so many times, and it's one of the reasons, you know, Helena and I are very picky about what rescues we talk to. Uh, and Helena will tell you, we've had this conversation many times, that we every week we get somebody contacting us that, are, that have an organization that rescue horses that wants to be on the air. And we won't put them on unless we're absolutely sure that they're, 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 they just don't have good intentions, but they also have a good model. That's right. I mean, it's like any business you you have to treat, um, you know, you have to have a point A and a point B. And in between, you need a plan to get there. Uh, if you're a profit based company, that that's your business plan or that's your marketing plan. If you're a rescue group, uh, it's sort of an operations plan, but you still have to have a business plan for that. And, you know, the nice thing about Janine is that she comes with this background. She's she's taking her education and and her first-hand experience and putting it into a plan and it's actually working so how many horses have you saved so far janine um we're up over you know i kind of lost count i counted exactly up to a hundred and then i think we're at like 104 now um the interesting thing of a hundred we're about to have our hundredth um celebration and the hundredth horse that was born we bought kind of accidentally um we bought a whole herd of horses that were about to go into the auction that um, were going to be sent back to the auction at New Holland, and they were uh, most of them were um, between one and two years old. But there was one mare that was running with the herd um, that was obviously in foal. But I did find someone who wanted to sponsor the mare, so we took the mare. None of these horses were halter broke. We, re- we ended up rescuing that week 11 horses. None of them were halter broke. And then I was away for 10 days. And wouldn't you know, the mare who didn't even look pregnant when I left, she had a foal while I was gone. And the foal is number 100. Oh, there you wow. go. Wow. <laughs> oh, you need to name her 100. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you need to yes. name her 100. And um, she's, she was born premature and um, very small. And the vet came and said, oh, I don't think she had a temperature. And, the, of course, the mare, you can't even get near her because she's, you know, she's not, not, never even had a halter on has been turned out loose with a stallion. So it made things a lot, a lot more difficult. Um, the foal, they said, well, it has a temperature. It's probably not going to make it. And this little this little foal was like, within three days, it's galloping around the paddock, and, you know, it's fine. So we're going to have a big, we have to, what the big issue is we want to bring, we're calling the little foal Minnie, and we want to bring Minnie and her mom to the event, but the mom still, we're, she's going to say you have some breaking to do first. Trainer. Just to get halter broke so she can go to her party. <laughs> she can go to her party. Now, there's motivation for you. You just have to convince her that the party's worth it. Right. 
Right. And, but right. but that's a lot of horses. And so, you know, if you think about the size of the average rescue operation, they might be able to take, if and if they're a really good one, maybe 60 horses. And, you know, if they can rehome three or four or even seven a year, uh, that's a big deal for them. So 100 plus horses means that whatever model you've got in place, Janine, is, is working Um and it's also nice to know that you've not taken on this burden all by yourself. You've got Missy as your partner, and you also have an advisory board as well with, yep, with yep. some heavy hitters on there. Yep, right? and we've got, a, a, you know, a whole, if I started thanking all the volunteers that we have um, involved, and, you know, we've got, we just have so many people that do a little piece and help out that it really just makes the difference. You know, and, and with the 100 horses, not all of them have been a success, but what the answer always is is whatever you get, you have to be committed to. Like some of the foals that we've, or the horses that we've rescued um, have, you know, issues with lameness, or some of them have, um, you know, training issues. And, but the, the people that have taken these horses, for the, you know, I'd say 99% of them have really stayed committed and, you know, they come back to me and they're like, you know, I'm really having a problem with the horse. And I'm like, well, take it to a natural horseman. And they really stay committed um, to make these horses work. So Yeah, I mean, um, they're not yeah, getting thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 sound horses here. You, you're, right. You are going to be – every horse comes with something. Um, yeah. So, like you said, they have but to be committed. But not all of them. But they, all no, of them. No, no. I mean, that, that's something could just be the fact that they're not trained. That, that mm-hmm. could be the something. The, yeah. But the point is that – Success is defined a little bit differently in the world of Hope yep. for Horses. Success is taking right. them out of that, you know, 100% sure bad situation. And again, so success could even be a humane euthanasia. Success could right. be uh, a year with, uh, you know, a, or, or success could just be moving on to a natural horsemanship trainer. It's defined in different ways. It's not uh, here, you yep. know, go hit the show ring and start winning ribbons right out of New Holland. So even the yep. fact that you are open to a, a flexible definition of success, you know, yep. for that, those I, I have horses. to make sure people understand that, you know, success for you will be when you can lead that horse out of the stall. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's a, two, it's a two-year-old that has had no handling at all and is not, not halted or broken. Just being able to lead it around a paddock is a big, is a big deal. But you need to have the, the people that rescue have to be the right mentality that will recognize these small milestones that you take for granted in a horse that you buy from a regular trainer. Um, right. So, and there's a lot of people out there that have some good horse experience that really are patient and they can work with the horses and have had unbelievable success um, with some of these horses. So there's, you know, so many great winning stories on the horses that we've rescued. This is nice. So if, if someone out there is, would like to follow up on a hope for horses, horse, um, where do you send them once they're ready to start their new lives? Do you have a list of places or do you have contacts where listeners might be able to get in touch and say, hey, I'd be interested in, you know, maybe taking on a Hope for Horses Rescued Horse? It's all, at, we're rolling out over the next couple of weeks, the equine rescue, and they're going to be able to go out to the equine rescue and say, I'm interested in fostering a horse. I'm interested in uh, retraining and rehoming. And there's also out on there, there's going to be a list of um, horses that are up for rehoming. So when trainers are done with these horses, they can offer them an up for adoption or, um, or for sale or for anything else. So that I'm really trying to make is a centralized spot for, um, for the rescues in this area. Great, great. But for now, uh, folks can go to hopeforhorses.org, and from there yep. they can launch into the Equine Rescue Network and all the other great initiatives that you have going on, yeah? Yep, yep, both sites are available. So, yeah, okay. definitely they can visit, visit us. Or our, our um, email is info at hopeforhorses.org. Great, and we'll post links on the Stable Scoop Radio Show's website. So if you happen to forget it, just remember Stable Scoop, and we'll put links up to Hope for Horses. Well, uh, Janine, thank you so much for for joining us today, and um, and for your efforts with this, and for being smart about it, because I think that's that's going to make all the difference in the world uh, to these young young fillies and colts and even the old ones. So, on behalf of the Horse Radio Network, thank you for your efforts, and thank you for joining us today. All right. Well, thanks for having me. So I just wanted to remind everybody that's hope the number four horses dot org. The hope the number four horses dot org. 
Joint Armor from KPP provides your horse with the building blocks necessary to maintain healthy joints throughout his lifetime. Kentucky Performance Products Quality Assurance provides you with the confidence that you are purchasing a safe, high-quality product. Your satisfaction is guaranteed. Joint Armor is concentrated and affordable. One jar lasts a whole 75 days. Joint Armor helps maintain fluid motion and flexibility in your horse's joints. It also supports normal cartilage development and reduces joint deterioration. Learn more about Joint Armor from Kentucky Performance Products and all their other terrific products at kppusa.com. That's kppusa.com. Let's take let's uh, let's go now to talk about something that we we um, well first why don't we give a plug for f- before we get to this next segment why don't we give a plug for the barnworks the barnworks yes the barnworks is a small but sophisticated marketing firm that caters to the equestrian professional whatever kind of profession you are whether you are a trainer instructor um, an animal health care provider. You're selling horses, you're rescuing horses. Our job is to take your message, repackage it so that it's easy to understand, looks good, and attracts more interest. And we can do that in a number of ways. We can do it with graphic design, we can do it with print work, brochures, logos, websites. We'll even write beautiful copy for you. So, whatever it is that you're trying to get across to the equestrian marketplace, contact the Barnworks. Just go to thebarnworks.com, take a look at the kinds of work we do, and give us a call or send an email. We can do it without breaking the bank, and we're sure to make you happy. TheBarnWorks.com. Now let's take a listen. We recorded this. This was done on the Horses in the Morning show on Wednesday morning, and we had the Horse.com does a weekly horse health segment. Michelle from the Horse.com and also Dr. Jones from Florida Equine was on, and we were talking about Lyme disease, and we thought it was so important, especially poor, poor Helena and, and her husband Peter are going through this right now personally with Peter being sick. And just having been diagnosed with it, uh, I, of course, had a battle with it for the last 10 years, Lyme disease, and horses do all the time. So let's talk about the horse version of Lyme disease and what those nasty little ticks can do and how to prevent it and what to do about it. So let's, let's take a listen to this before we wrap the show. We just thought it was that important that we'd add it in today. It's time for the weekly health report from Horse.com. Fantastic information and their attempt to ruin Glenn's lunch every week. Well, now it's time for the weekly health report with thehorse.com with Michelle and Dr. Jones from Florida Equine. But before we get started, regular listeners to this show and listeners to me babbling on for the last three years, on various shows, we'll know that uh, the topic we're going to talk about t- today is very near and dear to my heart because I've been uh, fighting it for a very long time and uh, had, had caused major problems in my life. So I'm glad that we're bringing it up today. Uh, Michelle, good morning. Good morning. Hi, Glenn. Yeah, this morning we're going to be talking about tick-borne diseases with our horses. And uh, one of those, of course, is Lyme disease, mm-hmm. which is the thing that uh, I personally have had a battle with. And we have Dr. Jones on here as well. Good morning, Dr. Jones. Good morning, Glenn. And um, I'm sorry to hear that you have that affliction and that's been going on with you. Uh, But to just quickly do a little bright side to the previous discussion you all were having, I'm thinking some sort of virtual veterinary medicine, how to treat your ailing racehorses, might be like an adjunct to that uh, <laughs> site. Uh, maybe I should develop something like that. You, anyway. you better uh, better pin down that URL, Dr. Jones. Yeah, yes, I'll exactly. What, I'll tell you what, at Doc- least $50 an hour would be the rate, wouldn't it? At least. <laughs> <laughs> you could give virtual LASIK shots. You could virtually do lameness exams. Oh my God, the, it's it's limitless what you could do. With it is <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> oh, okay, let's get serious. Uh, since I know Glenn, you'd like to add some comments in on this, and I think that's um, definitely a good idea. Well, let me just add, too, that this is so timely because Helena from the Stable Scoop Radio Show, my co-host over there, uh, husband just went to the doctor yesterday because he had gotten really, really sick over the last couple of days, and he did have the rash, and they took the blood test, but they've already put him on doxycycline for Lyme because, you know, and she lives in Rhode Island near where the epicenter of Lyme was to begin with in, in eastern Connecticut. So, anyway, all right, sorry. Go yeah. ahead, Michelle. 
So, so in the current issue of The Horse, uh, we have an article all about ticks with some great photos uh, that you can see so you can identify these little guys. They're ugly little things. Um, but Dr. Jones, can you start out by telling us what a tick is? Well, you know, the easiest way to describe them is they're an ecto, meaning outside, ectoparasite. And with that uh, thought, they are not internally ingested by the horses, but they do wreak a lot of havoc being on the outside of the horse. So your fly sprays and mosquito sprays are not going to be good enough to keep them from getting on your horse. You will have to actually do inspections of your horse to remove them. But they are an ectoparasite. Uh, they're blood-sucking. Um, and they come in different shapes and sizes. Okay. And how do they find the host? They're a parasite, so how do they find the host to latch on to? And oh, your breath, like a mosquito. They uh, no, don't come to good or bad breath. They come to just the carbon dioxide. <laughs> so they um, can detect that. So if I have minty on. breath, I'm still doomed? Sorry? If I have minty breath, I'm still doomed? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, because you do the oh. carbon dioxide that comes up with your minty breath. I would um, say that minty is pleasant. Garlic, maybe, no. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, any mammal, mammal is going to have CO2 on their exhaling, and uh, so the dogs, the cats, the horses, and the humans all are going to have these ticks in the areas that ticks are a problem. Yeah, so what kind of environments are they in? Are, since we're probably not going to run into them in our riding arena, but maybe when we're out... On in a trail the ride, or yeah, in the woods, trail rides, and also your area has to, you know, really have significant, um, not significant, but you know, needs to have a tick population. Here in Florida, we don't, we do have some tick population, but it's not a heavy tick uh, population. So, you know, certain environments are more apt to have them. North, uh, northeastern area, uh, like uh, Glenn said, Connecticut area for your Lyme's disease is going to be a heavy uh, tick population. Central. America, um, not Central America, but Central um, United States, and then, believe it or not, Texas area desert, not so much. Uh, so yeah, Arizona. we don't we don't have them here, <laughs> like in our in our desert area. But once we go into the mountains, just you know, half an hour, uh, we still we do have them when we're in the grasses and in the woodlands. And always check our dogs, but I don't always remember to check those horses. So, um, but absolutely. So what diseases are these little guys passing along to our horses? Well, the three that we think of right off the bat are the Lyme's disease, the pyroplasmosis, and the ehrlichiosis. Um, big fancy word there at the end. I put them in order of, of those of importance. The uh, Lyme's disease is um, the most important that we see here in the United States because okay. um, because the... Um, uh, he, as Glenn said, he has the uh, effects of it. Um, we see more effects of the Lyme disease. Pyroplasmosis is not seen in the United States, and ehrlichiosis is seen here in the United States, but it's not that commonly seen. Um, or maybe it's just not that commonly diagnosed would be another way of looking at it. So um, starting with, with Lyme disease, what are the clinical signs that we would see with that disease? And believe it or not, we see that here in Florida. The reason we see it, we see it in our winter clients that come down. Uh, they may not have been diagnosed up north because they're new to horses, got into the horse and has had the horse a couple of years and all of a sudden went on a trail ride before they left to come down for the winter circuit and thus we have uh, Lyme's disease. My venting horses, uh, especially from up north, are the ones we have to manage or maintain. Um, they usually are lame. Uh, they act like they've got like a muscle pain or they've, you know, just got arthritic changes. Um, they can have uveitis. They can have some sort of eye problem. Um, rarely do we see it, but neurologic signs or something else you can see, but it's rare. Um, those we treat with doxycycline, just like Glenn said, in the humans, and they turn around and look pretty darn good pretty quickly. Um, and they stay on a high dose of doxycycline for a long period of time. And that's one of the things about the lameness, too, to, to note is that it can, it's, uh, it can manifest itself. In other words, they could be lame on one foot one day and, and on, the, on another one another day. It kind of moves around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very, very frustrating for a veterinarian because you're looking at one leg and then you come back and they're lame in another leg. Yeah. And that is the, that's kind of the key that, besides the fact that it came from up north, that's key to check for titers. But if they come from up north and I hear I've got a lameness, it just came on recently, uh, they hadn't really been to an event 
they're just, you know, working the horse, I immediately take titers. And, of course, we don't run the titers here in Florida. We run them up in the New England area because they're um, more apt and, and do it on a regular basis up there. So we send all of our blood work up to uh, New England. And now so, one of the things, too, with humans, one second, Michelle, with the humans, um, <clears throat> about 50% of them will have a rash, will have what looks almost like ringworm. Uh, around where the, the tick bite was. Not, not everybody gets that. Is that prevalent in horses too or not something you see in horses? It's not that you'll see a rash, but you'll get a dermatitis. And not always is it seen because the areas of ticks that you primarily look for are going to be inside the ears and in the tail. So those two areas don't necessarily show a rash very easily unless you're cutting right. the ears or... Um, you know, a lot of hair starting to fall off in the tail area, but um, it's it, you can get a dermatitis, but it's not that. That's not usually the first thing we see. Okay. So uh, what what I think I'm hearing is that case history is important in diagnosing horses with Lyme disease. Is that and and humans too? I did have a client down here who had cancer and was in uh, remission on her cancer, you know, esophageal cancer, and. Uh, she uh, was very sick, and I'm sure Glenn can appreciate this. Um, she had gone to audit. She's a uh, competitive trail riding person. She had gone to audit a competitive trail ride weekend, came back sicker, and they thought it was something to do with cancer. She was in and out of the cancer hospital, couldn't figure out what it was. And she said she was starting to hallucinate. She was getting um, pretty yeah. bad in the hospital. And um, she thought, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to the light now. And for some reason, somebody decided to check she only had one tick on her, she said she found after the fitting. Somebody decided to go ahead and test her for lines, came up positive, put her in doxy. Feeling better. Okay. So, uh, so, so, the, so that's Lyme disease now, the py, uh, pyroplasmosis. What are the, the symptoms for, for that? Yeah, that uh, pyroplasmosis is, you know, fever is uh, usually the easiest thing to see um, with them. They, they go off feed, they have fever. Um, they can um, get anemic, but, you know, usually blood, running blood work on something like that. Um, it's when you do pull the blood for the anemia, you might as well pull it, an extra one for the titers to check for it. It's not something that we would think of first line here in um, the United States because, again, we don't have that disease here in the, the United States. But um, being suspicious of it and testing for it is always good for a veterinarian to be aware of, especially if you're in the Texas area, New Mexico, and Arizona, because they do see it in Mexico. So if there's horses that have crossed over or you have, a, again, a good history that the horses come from a country that has pyroplasmosis, that might be another test you might want to test for. Okay. And then the ehrlichiosis, if I said that correctly? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Well um, done. Yeah, that one can come in many different manifestations. It can come with um, swollen, swollen legs. It can come with um, diarrheas. Uh, it can come with fever. Uh, most people think of Potomac horse fever as a diarrhea um, disease. Um, they are now switching their gears from Potomac horse fever going from ticks to the animal for, to more of a mayfly or some sort of um, waterborne or water bug. Um, and not necessarily the ticks, but you do get the ehrlichiosis um, uh, bug within the white cell that you'll see on your blood work. And then, so with ticks, the big thing is avoiding getting these diseases by avoiding exposure to ticks. So what can you do to protect your horse? Again, it only takes one tick, you know, to, to cause some problems. So. Uh, when you go out to the woods, immediately check the ears and the tails would be the first place to check. Make sure that they do not have a tick in them. And when you get back, and remove it immediately. Um, when you're removing it, please be gentle in removing it. Of course, A, for your horse's sake, but B, also so you don't leave the mouth parts in there. They can, you know, secrete a glue um, to help them latch into the, to the uh, skin very well, and that can um, be excreted more with being aggressive and trying to remove them, or that glue just might be thick enough that you can't get the whole thing out. Um, but you do need to, to remove the entire tick when you do remove them. Uh, and I yes, have Jane. a question. Yes. All right. Number one, chicks. I've, I've pulled them out of my dogs before, and you've seen them, you know, wherever. They're not the fastest moving creatures. Okay, no. it's not like they jump or they fly or anything like that. How on earth do they make their way so immediately 
onto your dog, your horse, yourself. I mean, I, I pulled one off my earlobe one time when I was in New England, actually. And how did they get there? How did they climb all the way up to the horse's ears or tail? They're on trees. They're not just on the grass. They're on trees. So as you're riding by, they're going to drop onto you. So they'll drop into your hair and then immediately climb on your earlobe, that kind of thing. You brush the leaves, they're going to attach. So they, they, they are on trees as well as the grass. They're everywhere. Son of a yeah. gun, I didn't know that. Yeah, I had uh, a couple horses. Um, a client called me out and said that they needed to remove ticks from the ears because they had a hard time getting close to the horse's ears because they were very sensitive. And I'm thinking, oh, we don't have ticks here. You know, it must be something else. And I got out there they had quite a few ticks inside their ears. They were absolutely accurate on it. And they, they finally found out what the culprit was, is one tree in the pasture seemed to harvest all the ticks in. So what they did is they just had somebody come out and spray that tree. I'm not exactly sure what was sprayed on it. I thought you were going to say they cut the tree down. Yeah, no, <laughs> it was the only good tree. It was a very large tree. It was the only good Burn tree in the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> but they, 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 did, they did try to, um, they... Of course, until they resolved the problem, they kept the horses in a different pasture that didn't have a, that tree in it. But, um, but yeah. That's what I'd have done. I'd had a big bonfire that day for cooking hot dogs. There were some and tick bonfires. Believe it or not, in other parts of the United States, I did see a case while I was in school. Now, granted, this is about 20 years ago, um, of tick paralysis in a foal. So they can be so thick in the woods that this time of year that even a month-old foal could be completely covered in ticks and cause paralysis. And, of course, the paralysis is due to the neurotoxin that they can inject in um, when they're feeding on you. So um, even taking a couple ticks off will start nipping something in the bud. You don't wait until they're completely covered. So, so next, we did make some... Is, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to quite finish there. And maybe this is your next question. Is So when they say don't pull out the, the, you know, you have to watch out for the, you said the eating parts that I always thought, you know, if you pull the tick out from behind, the, you leave the head in. What does that do? It's a mouth part. It's not the complete head. It's actually the mouth part that latches in. Um, you can still get those out because now you've detached the animal from that, and that mouth part is only stuck now by the glue, nothing else. So you can eventually wiggle that piece out. Um, you just have to be due diligence on it and be very careful. Yeah, and if you don't think you can get it, you can call a veterinarian. Yeah, and in, in the article on the current issue of the horse, we make some recommendations of not crushing the tick as you're pulling it out to wear gloves to protect yourself from those diseases. Because like we've talked about, uh, humans and horses are uh, impacted by those. Um, and then also to use tweezers to grab onto those little guys and pull them out. And if the mouthpiece does come out, get in there and, and with the tweezers and pull the mouthpiece out as well. Gross. And yeah, I think gross. it's important, too. Gross. I think one of the most important things, I don't want to run out of time before we bring this up, and, and uh, one of the most important things is catching it early is better than not catching it early. There, there have been some horses that have gotten very, very sick because they've been untreated at all uh, for this. And it's same with humans. If, if you catch it early, which I did, and I had it for about two years before they ever caught it. And I just kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and nobody knew why. Now, this was, t you know, eight years ago. Um, but, you know, I think that's one of the important things, too, isn't it, Dr. Jones? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Jones, do you have some recommendations for checking your horses for ticks after you go out for that trail ride or pull them in from the pasture? Uh, the common places, again, I can't stress enough, are going to be the ears and the tails. And I don't mean that you just kind of brush through the tail and you call it good or comb through the tail and you call it good. You actually have to look on the tail and, you know, down all the way down to the base of the hair and see if you mm -hmm. see them. And use your fingers to feel for yeah. Absolutely, as well, yeah. as well as your eyes. So, Okay, well, on Facebook we've put up a slideshow or an album of all different kinds of ticks so you can see what they look like. Uh, and it spells out where they are regionally so you can find out which ticks are a problem in your area. They are really gigantic in these photos and really disgusting. So go to yeah. Facebook and check that out. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Jones, and, uh, and thanks, Glenn, for your, your input, too. These little you guys. nasty things cause big problems. Yep, that's true. And, and you know what? Lyme disease is usually carried, Dr. Jones, isn't it, by the deer tick, which is the tiniest. We're talking pinhead size. Yes, it is. So it is kind of hard to catch. But, I mean, if you're looking at your horse every day, which I hope most people are, 
especially those that are being committed to going out and trail riding quite a bit, that they are going to be grooming this every day. So if they didn't catch it right after the ride, they should hopefully be able to catch it the next day. Yeah. Yeah, not something to fool around with, something to get your vet out. If you're trying to save money, this is one you you want to have your vet out because it ain't going to get better by itself. Absolutely. They need that. Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you again, Michelle, from thehorse.com. And thank Dr. Jones from Florida Equine at floridaequine.com. We'll talk to you guys again next week. Okay, Take bye. Care. That's it for this week, Helena. Serious topics today on the show. Serious topics. Next week we're going to have to do something totally silly and funny and goofy and, oh, that's not hard for us to do. We'll just be ourselves. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just sit and talk to each other next week. <laughs> That's if we can get out anything. with a, Honestly, it's 100 million degrees here. I have no air conditioning. You're the one who lives in Florida. And I'm hungry. <laughs> and I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm hot. You're hungry. All right, it's We're a grumpy gonna... day, everybody. We're just going to call it quits. Thank it's a you grumpy for joining day. us. Don't forget all the other shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. And don't forget our email addresses, helena at horseradionetwork.com and glenn with two ends at horseradionetwork.com. Did you I... want to add anything? <laughs> No, I guess <laughs> I'm done. You had a new I'm... clever ending last week. Well, I and you know what? I forgot what it was. It was um, go forth and scoop. Um, oh, it was something no, scoop. It was something scoop. All right, everybody, this is terrible. We we have been trying for three years to come up with a clever ending that both of us like. All the other shows have clever endings, and they come up with it in the second week. We it's taken us three years, and we still don't have a clever ending. Well, we had one which was. Not very clever. Right. Was that that there was for the problem. Week? And that's and the problem. That we, every year, and last week I said, oh, that was a clever ending. I, do we have to go back and listen, listen to last week's show to remember? I don't know. Talk amongst yourselves. All <laughs> here, let me see here. Look, going to last week's show, I, I'm going to hit play. only take 10 seconds. We'll figure out what the clever ending is here. And then it'll Here's be worth it. Just it's keep starting. listening. That's right. Do Just keep not turn off blah, your iPod. Blah, 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 blah. Do not clever hit the ending pause coming button. shortly. Do you, not hit the red ending. button, the red X. Oh, last Maybe. week was the Inner City Slickers. If you didn't miss that, it was the uh, Three Dog Night uh, drummer guy. He was good. Yeah, Michael McNeil. He was so grateful. Like so, him. so grateful. Oh, here we Definitely. go. Hold on. Here, it's coming okay. up. Okay. All right. Can you hear it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. That guy should shut up. He talks too much. He does. Yeah, what a blabber mouth. Shh, I can't hear. Put it, turn it louder. Happy scooping. scooping. That's what it was. <laughs> I'm so smart. <laughs> okay. All right, so, wait, you said how to gr- have a good week, and I said thank you, Glenn. Happy scooping. All right, so let's try it again. Ready? Okay. Three, yep. two, one. What was my line? <laughs> <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> um, I don't know. Oh, my God, it's hot. <laughs> have a, oh, here we go. Ready? Okay. Serious now. This is a serious show. Okay. Three, two, one. Well, have a great week, Alina. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to say thank you and happy scoop. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Go. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you, Glenn. Happy scooping. Cut. It didn't sound so clever. No, All right, it didn't sound good. as clever as last week for some reason. <laughs> if anybody has a great new ending for our show that involves the word scoop and Poop's okay, too. Scooper okay. and poop, both of them, whatever. Just put it on our Facebook page. We'd be happy to have a clever new ending. It would be Thank good. All right, I know. need to go sit up in the Bye. air conditioning for 10 minutes. <laughs>